All right, folks, thanks for joining me today for my DBA Tools uh, life hack session. Uh, my name is Jess Pomfret. My pronouns are she and her. I am a cloud and data center management MVP, uh, and I'm passionate about automation, proper football, and fitness. All right, so the agenda for today's session, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what DBA Tools is, make sure everyone is familiar with the PowerShell module. Uh, we'll do a little PowerShell 101. Uh, to make sure we're all up to speed. As I mentioned, it is a PowerShell module, so this will be a PowerShell heavy session, uh, but I'm confident that I'll be able to teach you enough in this session to be able to use DBA tools uh, and to get through this. Uh, then I have uh, six life hacks for you. These are gonna be little segments that are uh, tasks that we need to perform as data professionals uh, that are gonna make our lives easier. So we're gonna work out how to test our backups. We're gonna manage logins and access. We're going to look at masking sensitive data, which is becoming a hot topic these days. Uh, we'll look at how to migrate things. Uh, we'll test whether we're meeting best practices. And then last but not least, uh, documentation. Who doesn't love documentation? I'll show you how to speed that up uh, and make it almost pain free. So what is DBA tools? As I mentioned, it's a PowerShell module and it's an open source PowerShell module, uh, which means that it's hosted on GitHub and is uh, made up of code contributed for, uh, from many people. It's basically a uh, command line SSMS. So with Management Studio, you can easily manage different databases, manage different uh, jobs or logins, but it's very much one at a time, right? You click through on, on the GUI on one database to change some settings. Uh, with DBA tools and PowerShell, you can change those settings across multiple databases at once or multiple instances. Uh, if, you're, if you have databases hosted on multiple servers, you can easily change certain settings on all of those at once. So it takes the power that you get in Management Studio uh, and, and multiplies it. It is MIT licensed. That is a short and uh, simple license. That basically means as long as you keep the copyright and license notices intact, you can use it for whatever you need. Uh, you can use it for private use, commercial use. Uh, you can even modify it. And finally, on this slide, I want to make sure uh, that everyone understands that it is secure. So it's built on PowerShell, which the the PowerShell team work by on this secure by design uh, principle, trying to make PowerShell itself as secure as possible. And then DBA tools is kind of layered on top of that. So first of all, it's code signed. What that means is when the uh, DBA tools core team ha has a module version ready to publish, uh, which is published to the PowerShell gallery, uh, it is signed by a certificate and that is included uh, in the module that's published to the PowerShell gallery. So when you download that module, if that cert is still intact, you know you, that you have the code that was put there by the DBA tools team. It hasn't been tampered with or changed in any way. Uh, pester tests. So there's also a, a bunch of pester tests within the module to make sure that any changes to it don't affect current functionality. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, in a second, but it, it makes sure that uh, if someone is contributing uh, with good intentions, they don't break existing functionality that's needed for other people. Finally, uh, the DBA tools team uses branch policies in GitHub where the code is uh, hosted. Everyone uh, like myself will create a PR with a new piece of code or some changes to code. We'll submit that PR to the dev branch um, and it'll be reviewed by uh, someone else. Make sure it meets all of the standards and all of the pester tests pass. Once it's got past that, it will then be merged from the development branch into the main branch, uh, which is what is published to the PowerShell gallery. So there are two steps uh, for my code or for anyone's code to get into DBA tools, uh, which adds that extra safety uh, safety net. Okay. So DBA tools was created by Chrissy Lemaire. Uh, the uh, the goal was to migrate SharePoint instances. So she had she had a SharePoint instance that she needed to migrate. And if you know anything about SharePoint on SQL Server, under the covers, there are tons of databases, tons of logins, jobs, link servers, all these pieces that need to be moved from one server to another. So she had this really long script uh, that went through all of the things to move and move them from one to another. And it worked really well, but it wasn't very easy for other people to use. So in September 2015, uh, she was convinced to make it into a module, kind of break that script down into different pieces. Uh, and she published it to GitHub. The first commit was in September 2015. It then took almost four years to get to 1.0, which is like your main first software launch, right? Um, the reason was that it uh, it exploded into how big it was, right? 
There were over 160 contributors and 550 commands when it, when it launched uh, 1.0. And the reason it took so long to get it launched was uh, Chrissy wanted and the team wanted to make sure that everything was standard. The parameter naming all felt the same. Uh, there was help on all of the commands. Everything was safe and, and secure and working as well as possible uh, before it became 1.0. So since then, there has, has been 116 uh, releases since then. And there's now 582 functions uh, as of the 12th of September uh, and 590 pester tests. So those are the, the, the things that make sure uh, that functionality is still intact whenever we add changes to it. Finally, on this slide, I wanted to mention there is a book coming out, Learn DBA, DBA Tools in a Month of Lunches, which is written by uh, Chrissy and Rob Sewell. Uh, there are, I believe, 10 of the 26 chapters are out already on a, a Manning early access uh, preview. So you can go ahead and buy that now, read the first 10 chapters, and then as they release more, uh, they, they're added to your book. So check that out if you haven't already. All right, so let's head over to uh, the demos and I'll show you more about DBA tools. So as I mentioned to start with, we'll make sure we do a little PowerShell 101 and get us up to speed on how we get hold of DBA tools. Uh, how we explore what commands are available, and how we can use the built-in help. Uh, then I'll mention splatting, which is uh, code formatting at the end of this section. So first things first, we need to get hold of the module. As I mentioned, it is hosted on the PowerShell gallery. Uh, so if we are on a computer with PowerShell 5.0 or above, and we're connected to the internet, we can use install-module DBA tools to pull down the latest version from the PowerShell gallery. If we need to use the module on a machine that's not connected to the internet, uh, we can use save module uh, DBA tools to a path, so C uh, slash temp. That'll take the module, put it in C temp, and I can copy that out to my server if that's where I want to use it, if that's not connected to the internet. If I've used the install module method to install DBA tools, I can keep it up to date really easily with update dash module. Uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, releases every few days of DBA tools, and so it's really important to keep your module up to date, and you can do that easily with this built-in command. So when we have DBA tools downloaded from the PowerShell gallery, we need to import it into our session. So to do that, we can use import module DBA tools. I'm passing in a required version on this, but if you don't pass that in, it will just import the latest version into your session. If I use get dash modules DBA tools, you can see the module that was imported into my session, and it's version 1.0.113, which is what I asked for, uh, and that's now ready to use in my session. I can also use the list available parameter on get module to see all of the versions available on my machine. You can see I have a couple of newer versions and a couple of older versions still kicking around. One of the things I love about PowerShell is it wants to help you. It wants uh, to make it easy for you to find the commands you want to use and then teach you how to use them. So the first part of that is the get dash command. Now, this is not DBA tool specific. This is PowerShell uh, level stuff. So you can use this with any module. So get dash command passing in the module of DBA tools, and you can see them flying by. These are the 580 odd uh, commands that are available within DBA tools. That's really hard to know which one I want to use, right? I have a specific thing in mind. How do I find out what a, which command I need? So we can pass in a pattern. So get dash command, I'm asking for something with compression in the name from the module DBA tools. And you can see it's returned three things, get, set, and test DBA, DB compression. So that was PowerShell level, right? We can use that with any module. The DBA tools team took that one step further and created find DBA command. And if I ask for find DBA command for the same pattern compression, you'll see a lot more commands are returned. So the first one, backup DBA database, doesn't initially feel like it's anything to do with compression. But what find DBA command does is it reads all of the comment-based help uh, and looks for the word compression in any of the parameters, any of the examples, uh, anything that may, might be to do with compression. And I can tell you backup DBA database has a parameter uh, for compression, compressing uh, your database backups. So that's why it's appeared here. There are some other parameters you can use on find DBA command. So if I say, uh, show me the ones that I authored, uh, there are four commands returned. And the reason I'm showing you this is not to be like, hey, look, I made four uh, commands and they made it into DBA tools. Uh, these four commands, I contributed the first bit of code for them to DBA tools. But since then, uh, they have gone through many versions and have been improved by many people. So I had a specific use case for backing up and restoring my certificates. Uh, so I wrote the code for that. I submitted it to DBA tools and created the functions. 
since then, people have added more parameters, more use cases, more examples, made them more robust. So overall, uh, those functions are better than the ones that I would have had if I hadn't shared it with DBA tools. And this is really the power of open source software, right? This sharing and, and uh, enhancing of code. So that's really cool. So as I mentioned, the, uh, PowerShell as a whole wants to teach you how to use it. So this is the second piece of that puzzle, uh, the get dash help. And this is PowerShell uh, level stuff, not specific to DBA tools. But if I do get dash help and I pass in a command name, test DBA DB compression, it'll output to the screen or to the console um, how I use this command. It'll give me a bit of a description. That was pretty fast. Uh, short description, the syntax that I need to use, a longer description with some links. Uh, and, and then related links, and then some options for seeing more. My favorite parameter for this is the show uh, window parameter. And that's probably going to open on the other screen. Uh, here it is. And you can see that this has opened a separate window that I can keep open while I'm writing my code. And I can search in this box for specific things like database, and it'll highlight it. If I scroll down in this window, it goes through every parameter in detail. And at the bottom here, you can see there's a whole section of examples. So I can copy this out, paste it into my session, and start learning how to use this command. The benefit of this being separate is I can keep this open, go back to my console, uh, and then come back to this if I need it. So that's the show window parameter. Finally, for this section, I want to talk about splatting. <clears throat> splatting is just a way of formatting our code uh, to make it more readable. So you can see here I'm using get DBA DB compression. I'm passing in some parameters, and then I'm selecting an object, and it's gone off the screen, right? It's really hard to read. If I run this, all it's going to do is return the first five objects from this command. And you can see that returned in the console. With splatting, we're going to instead take those parameter names that we had in get DBA DB compression and turn them into this hash table that I've called splat get. And then this hash table. Uh, is passed in with the special at symbol uh, into the function. Um, so you can see that this is just easier to read. And this func this command that I have highlighted and run is running the exact same thing that happened on line 49. It's just formatted a little easier for us to read. And this is how I'm going to format my examples in this demo. Uh, you don't have to use this in your PowerShell code. Uh, neither one works better. It's just for readability. So that is how we get started with DBA tools, how we get the module uh, imported. Uh, and now we're ready to use it. So first things first, and this is my first life hack, is testing your backups. right? As DBAs or data professionals, we all know how important taking backups is. But if you take the backups and you don't know if they're going to work, you really don't have that much security. right? So we want to take those backups, restore them, test them out, make sure they're good. And I'll show you how to do that with DBA tools. Uh, we're going to review our backup history of what uh, what backups we've already taken. I'll show you how you can actually back up your databases with DBA tools and then to test those backups. So first things first, and I'm using splatting here. You can see I've got my SQL instance in my hash table, get DBA DB backup history. And if I do this, I'm asking for the backup history on MS SQL 1, uh, which is an instance running on my laptop. So you can see I have an AdventureWorks database, and it's returned three rows. I've only ran three backups total on this instance. If this was production, I'd see pages and pages, and I could filter that if needed. So I have a full backup, a differential backup, and a log backup from this morning. I also know that I have a database admin database on my MS SQL 1 instance, and I can use backup DBA database with these parameters uh, to actually run a full backup uh, of that database now from PowerShell. Uh, since I didn't specify where that backup should go, it's going to go for the, it's going to be stored in the default location of your SQL instance. All right, so you can see a similar kind of output has been returned. And this is what I was mentioning with the standardization of parameters and output. So SQL instance, MS SQL 1, the database name, it was a full backup, how big it is, how long it took, that kind of information is returned. So now we have backups for both databases on that instance. I want to make sure that they are good, right? I want to make sure that I can restore those backups. And that's where test DBA last backup comes in. With this one, I'm going to pass in the SQL instance, which is MS SQL 1, where those databases are hosted, the database names, AdventureWorks, and database admin. And then I'm going to specify a destination database. I don't really want to test my backup restores on my production server. So I'm going to offload this to MS SQL 2. I'm going to turn on the verbose switch. And then I'm going to save the results to the results variable. 
So if I kick this off, you'll start to see some uh, output being returned. <clears throat> so first thing it's going to do is uh, is check out what backups we already have from our MS SQL 1. It's going to build the latest LSN chain, so full backups, differentials, any log backups, to get to the latest point in time. And it's going to then restore those to MS SQL 2. Uh, once it's restored to the database server, it will run DBCC check DB to make sure uh, nothing, there's no corruption or anything. Uh, and then it will drop that restored copy on MS SQL 2 before moving on to the second one. You can see it's doing database admin now. And it will do the same. For this one, there's only one full backup. Uh, so that's all it used. But if we scroll up, we can see the output for uh, the database uh, so, so for AdventureWorks, and you can see that there are multiple backup files that we use, the full backup, the differential backup, and then a log backup. And you get some pretty useful information back, right? Like how long the restore took, how long DBCC took, uh, whether they were successful or whether any corruption was found. This kind of information would be good to keep uh, over time to see how long our restores take and when they were last successful. Write DBA data table can take any object in PowerShell and put it into a SQL Server table. Uh, you can use this for all kinds of things, but I'm going to take the results that I saved from our test backups and pass them into the MS SQL 1 database admin, a table called test restore, and I've specified auto create table to true. Uh, if that means if the table doesn't already exist, DBA tools will try and work out the, uh, the data types and then create that table and populate it with the data. If you're going to use this in production, I would recommend that you create the table uh, with the appropriate data types because DBA tools is pretty good at doing date types and uh, numeric types. It is not so good at strings and it will just put nvarcar max for any string data it finds. But if we come over here to Azure Data Studio and we're connected to MS SQL 1, I can show you the results from that test restore table that was created by DBA tools. It, it's captured all of the information we saw on the screen the source server, test server, the database, uh, the restore results, and the DBCC results. You can see how long the restore took, how long the DBCC took, and the dates and files that we use for backup for the restore. So this is really quite useful, right? If we did this over and over again, we could start to, add, we could start to see how long the restores were taking, whether we were still able to meet our SLAs. Uh, we can also do this in one line. So test backup and immediately pipe it to write DBA data table. We'll test the backups. And as soon as that uh, object is passed along the pipeline, which is signified by this pipe, it'll be written into our database table. So say I did this every week. I picked a few databases and I restored them, or all of my databases from a smaller shop, and restored them to make sure they were good and kept track of how long this took in a table. Now when someone comes to your desk and they're like, oh, I may have dropped this table. How long will it take you to get it back? I can go to my database, see how long the last restore took, and be like, oh, that'll take me an hour. And I'll have an accurate idea without having to just kind of guess or guesstimate of how long that will take. Now, if I run this again, obviously, I'm using the same files because I haven't done any more backups. But you can see uh, we've added another two rows for the two databases, more successful backups or restores, sorry, and how long those took. So this is how you can easily uh, test your backups with DBA tools uh, with just a few lines of code. Um, it's really, really simple and a, and a great use case. So that was testing our backups. We're going to move on to managing logins. All right, so I'll show you how to add a login to your server, add a user to your database, assign some permissions, change some passwords. And then, as I mentioned uh, previously, the benefit is really in handling uh, multiples, right? So I'll show you how you can read in users from a CSV and populate them, uh, create them straight on your instance. So first things first, we got new DBA login. And this you can use for SQL logins, which is what I'm using in this example, creating a JSP SQL login. You can use it for AD users or, or groups. Uh, but we're going to specify our SQL instance, our login, and then a secure password, which is currently saved as a secure string in PowerShell. So when I do this, it's created my login on the instance, right? I don't have access to anything anymore uh, currently, but my login is out there ready for use. So the next step is to use new DBA DB user. For that JSP login, I'm giving myself access to database admin. Now, this is equivalent of, check of ticking the checkbox uh, next to the database name in Management Studio. So now I have public access to this database. I I'm not in any roles yet. 
So let's add myself to DB Data Reader. I need read access to database admin, and I can do that with add DBA DB role member. Uh, confirm false is just saying, don't prompt me. I'm, I definitely want to do this. If I don't do that, it'll pop up and say, are you sure you want to? Uh, but you can see I'm adding Jess P to the database admin DB Data Reader role. So this is the equivalent of ticking the DB Data Reader box in, in Management Studio. We can also change the password. So that JSP login, I need to change the passwords annually for security reasons. I can use set DBA login uh, to get a new password. And I'm using read host uh, to save it as a secure string. So when I run this, you'll see that it asks for the new password down here and I can put in something super secure. And DBA tools will go and change that uh, SQL login password. So you could use this and you could wrap some more logic around it to keep track of when you change these passwords, who changed it, what it was changed to, perhaps, if you're saving that securely. Um, but that can all be done through DBA tools. But so far, this isn't really giving us much benefit, right? I'm doing one login at a time. I'm not getting much, uh, I'm not doing it much faster than I would if I went through Management Studio and added it in. So let's take a look at using it for multiple things. So here I have a CSV called Users CSV. And if I find that over here and open it, you can see it's just a list of usernames, passwords, in clear text on notes. So this is not how you want to do it in production. Uh, server names, database names, and then roles that we should add them to. So for this one example, I've got two roles being added to the Jill user. So perhaps you get an email once a week with new employees and you need to give them access to something. You can take that CSV, import it into PowerShell as an object, and then using the for each method, which is PS, uh, PowerShell for syntax, the, the three syntax is lower in the demos if you need it. And for each row in the user CSV, I'm going to connect to my server. I'm going to do new DBA login to create the login. I'm going to do new DBA DB user to create the user within the database. And then add DBA DB role member to add the role. So if I run this, it's going to go through. And for each person we saw in that spreadsheet, it's going to create the login, uh, check the box next to the database, and then check the box of the roles. Uh, that we want to assign. And you can see that's done. So this is much faster, right? For me to add four logins uh, to, to one server, and it could have been multiple servers too, right? We could have provided permissions across our entire estate uh, in this kind of method using DBA tools. So this is really the power, right? When we have multiples and we can automate it and we can script it, perhaps this is even in a job, this CSV gets dropped once a week and it can automatically be picked up and processed. So that was managing logins uh, with DBA tools. If you do have any questions um, available in the chat, feel free to drop them in as we're going through. I should have mentioned that already probably. Um, but if you think of questions after the fact or you're watching a recording, uh, feel free to drop me an email or, or find me on Twitter. All right, so moving on to section four, we had, uh, we're gonna talk about data masking. So how do we find potentially sensitive data in our databases? Uh, We'll look at the randomizer functions that come with DBA tools, and then we'll create this masking config and mask our, our data uh, to keep it safe. So first of all, invoke DBA DB PII scan. For this, I'm passing in my SQL instance, a database name, and a specific table, and I'm using outgrid view to, to display the results. What this is going to do is it's going to scan the data in your table and see what it thinks might be sensitive. And when it finds that, it's going to pop it up into this uh, outgrid view and tell you a little bit about what it found and why it thinks it might be sensitive. Just waiting for this to finish up. OK, cool. All right. So you can see my database is AdventureWorks, my schema, and my table is employee. And these are the things that it found that it thinks might be sensitive. So national ID number, it thinks that might be a personal ID. Uh, login ID could be credentials. Gender could be sensitive. Uh, and Roguewood, which every time I do this, I mention that I'm going to work out why it thinks Roguewood is sensitive, and I still haven't. Uh, but this is a great way of scanning your table and seeing what kind of data you have. Obviously, the best option would be to ask your application team uh, and, and ask them to provide where the sensitive data is stored. But you can use this to kind of get an idea of what you're dealing with. Um, DBA tools is using the bogus DLL under the uh, under the covers. And so that comes with a whole data set of, of data, basically, that we can use to replace our actual production data with. So if we take a look at the get DBA randomized type, these are all the types of data that exist in this data set for us to use. So you can see we've got addresses, we've got companies, we've got person, 
Uh, we've got name. So these are all the things that we can use. And if we do get DBA randomized type again uh, for the person type and expand on the subtype, you can see that we can get people's addresses, people's date of birth, first names, gender, etc. Uh, we can also use get DBA randomized type to find uh, patterns. So I need credit card details. What, what data do I have available? And you can see credit card CVV and credit card number come up. Or if I look for names, these are all of the types of names that could be replaced. First names, product names, account names, etc. Once we've used get DBA randomized type to find out what kind of data we want to create, we can use get DBA randomized value to actually generate data. So in this case, I'm saying I want a random int that's bigger than 10,000, and you can see it's provided this number. And I can say that I want to use the name type and the first name subtype uh, for a US name, and I get a random name back, Camden. And I can do the same for address and zip code. The reason I'm showing you zip code is there are multiple formats for zip code. So this time it came back with just the five digit zip code. And this time it came back with a five digit zip code plus a four digit extension. So you can also apply a format uh, mask and say, I only want the five digit zip code. Uh, you can see that was returned here. So this is great, right, for creating one off bits of, bits of data. But to mask a whole table or a whole database, we, we need something more. And that's where the masking config and masking uh, commands of DBA tools comes in. So new DBA DB masking config. I'm saying this. MS SQL 1 data uh, instance, AdventureWorks database, employee table, and then these are the four columns that I want to mask. Now, this is going to actually mask, um, like actually change the data. So we're going to do this on our non-production systems, right? Running this in production will keep your data very safe because it will be gone and you'll be restoring it. Uh, so just remember, this is uh, post uh, restore to non-prod. We're going to mask it there, for example. All right, so let's create our masking config file. And what that's going to do is going to take a look at the data that we have and try and guess what we're going to want to mask it with. And we can modify this file to, to make it more accurate. It's just created this JSON file that will be used for the actual masking. So first things first, let's go check out the data that we have in our AdventureWorks employee table. All right, so here's the first 10 rows. Uh, we've got a national ID number, looks a bit like a social security number in the US. Uh, our login ID, which is AdventureWorks slash a name. Uh, we've got job title, we've got our CEO's information in here, we've got birth date. So keep, a, keep an eye on this uh, data and we're going to mask it because uh, we want to make sure that we don't know that our chief executive officer was born on this date. So back to the JSON file. This is just going to tell you it's a, da a data masking configuration type of file, employee table from the human resources schema, and then the columns to mask. First one is national ID number. And this is generated by DBA tools, right? This is it guessing uh, on the kinds of data that we want to create for the masking. So it reckons we want a random int. Yeah, that's that's not bad, but these values are a bit off. Uh, login ID, it's going to use internet username, which is pretty good. It's not exactly in the right format, but that is what it is. For job title, it was unable to determine that. So it's going to create a random string using these letters and numbers, uh, which will not look like job titles. And then birthday, it found it was a date in the past. In the past, so I've taken this and I've modified it a little bit to make it more in line with what we need. So you can see national ID number. I'm saying I want a character string of numbers that is nine long. For login ID, I'm actually using a composite type here. Uh, it's going to generate a first name, but it is going to apply that to the end of AdventureWorks slash, so it will look like a login. Uh, when we mask it. For birth date, I'm using date in the past, but I can specify minimum and maximum date values. And for job title, we're using name and job title as the data types. So once we've modified our file, we can use test DBA DB masking config to make sure our file is still valid JSON. Uh, and you can see nothing was returned, so we're good. This example right here is when there was some changes made to the masking configuration process. Uh, there was a new column added, and I didn't have it in my masking config. Uh, so this is just an example of what would be returned if our config file was not valid. So we already took a look at the data. Let's use invoke DBA DB masking to change it. Now what this is going to do is it's going to go through, take our JSON file and update our values uh, in our DBA tools, uh, in our AdventureWorks database, our employee table. 
There have been some significant performance improvements on this recently. So this is running much faster than it used to uh, to handle larger data sets. But you can see I had 290 rows that were updated in 10 seconds. And if I come back in here, you can see that our names have changed, right? Our, our uh, CEO used to be named, his login was AdventureWorks Ken. The national ID has changed, the login has changed, the job title has changed, that row is now a forward response strategist, and the birthday is different. So you can see this kind of looks like real data still, but it is no longer our production sensitive data. So that's how we can use DBA tools to mask our data. Um, this is a really great use case for if you're refreshing test environments or non-production environments and you need data that looks and feels like production data but doesn't contain that sensitive uh, aspect. All right, so moving on to migrations. As I mentioned, this is where DBA tools uh, first started on SharePoint migrations. This is what it was born to do. So we're gonna look at what the copy commands we have available. Uh, we'll look at the databases and logins we have on our instance, and then we'll migrate databases and logins to a new instance. Uh, they're currently on a 2017 instance. We're going to move them to 2019, and then we're going to upgrade those databases. There is a blog post outlining some of this if you want to read it on the DBA Tools blog. All right. So first up, let's do get command, uh, module DBA tool, and then I'm saying verb copy. So that means we're going to get all of the things that can move uh, database objects from one instance to another. And you can see there's a whole list. There are some agent operators, uh, agent schedules, backup devices, credentials, databases, uh, DB mail settings, query store options. All of these things can be taken from one instance and recreated on the, on the second instance. So first things first, let's let's take a look at our environment, right? We're going to use get DBA database. I'm piping it to a select object to select just a few things and then formatting it as a table. I am excluding system uh, databases and I'm using out variable again to capture the output to the DBs variable. So you can see I have those two databases that we already know about, AdventureWorks and database admin, recovery modes full, owner's SA compatibility level. We can do the same with get DBA login against the MS SQL 1 instance, and we can list the logins that we created. Uh, some of these should look familiar. There's the Jess P login, Jill, Jane, and Bob that we created from the CSV. Uh, there are also Windows users and built-in administrator groups um, which show up. So when we're ready to move our, uh, our application databases, first things first is we probably want to take down the application, right? But after the application team say they've definitely taken it down, we want to make sure that there are no hang it, that no process is still connected. And we can use get DBA process for that. And if I run this, uh oh, you'll see that someone is still connected uh, using the SA login from Azure Data Studio. So I can pipe that get DBA processes straight to stop DBA protest to process to gently kill that SPID, make sure my databases are in a, uh, are no longer being used and are ready to be moved. If you run that and you see a bunch of connections from your application, you probably want to go back to your application team and ask them nicely to uh, shut it off properly uh, instead of just killing it. But th that option is available if we need it. All right, so let's migrate our databases. So migrate uh, copy DBA database is what we're going to use. We've specified a source of MS SQL 1, a destination, which is where they'll end up, and the databases uh, from the DBs variable that we saved earlier. We are going to use the backup restore method, which means we need to specify a shared path that uh, both instance accounts for uh, MS SQL 1 and MS SQL 2 need to have access to that path. Um, if our databases were larger and it was going to take a long time to do backup restore, we could use the log shipping method uh, with copy DBA database also. I'm using the verbose uh, switch again so I can see uh, what's going on. As I mentioned, I'm nosy and I like to know. But I can tell you right off the bat, uh, first step is we're backing up the databases. Uh, we're backing up the AdventureWorks database on MS SQL 1 to that shared path. And now we are restoring it to MS SQL 2. Once this restore, and you'll notice it's uh, there are three files. So the, the backup, the most optimal setup for the backup was determined that backing up to three files uh, was the most performance. So that's what we're using under the covers. You can specify that. Uh, if you want to, if you wanted to use just one file or you wanted to use more. Um, once it's backed up to the shared path, it's restored to the new instance. And you can see uh, 
both databases were successfully moved. We also need to move our login. So I'm going to move the JSP login from MS SQL 1 to MS SQL 2 uh, using copy DBA login. And what this is going to do is it's going to script out my JSP login and then run that script on MS SQL 2. That is going to keep the SIDs the same so we won't have uh, orphaned users. And it's going to keep the password the same, uh, which is handy too. Finally, now that our databases have been moved over, we can set them offline on MS SQL 1 as we don't want anything accidentally connecting. And we can use set DBA DB state uh, with offline set to true uh, to set those offline. Cool. All right. Let me show you over here. If I refresh the MS SQL 1 database, you can see that they're now offline on MS SQL 1 and they now exist on MS SQL 2. So we have successfully migrated our databases and logins to a new instance. OK, so yet, let's check out get DBA DB compatibility for that MS SQL 2, the new instance. You can see that uh, the system databases are at version 150, but my two new uh, user databases that I just migrated are still at 140. If I add a couple of properties to my compats flap, uh, the database name of database admin and the target compat of 15, I can then use set DBA DB compatibility to up that to the 150 version. You can see that's returned here. Database admin is now at version 150. Another benefit of open source software is of all the great blog posts and content that's already out there on the internet, the DBA tools team have found things like this blog post on upgrading to SQL Server and taken the, the knowledge and expertise and wrapped it up into a command like invoke DBA DB upgrade. So with this, and if I kick this off uh, to start running, it's going to target the database admin database again. It is going to update the compatibility level if it wasn't already. It's going to run check DB with data purity. It'll run DBCC update usage, update stats, and SP refresh view. So all the things that you should do uh, when you upgrade your database, this is an older blog post, but it's still really relevant. Uh, you can do with one command in DBA tools. And you can see that these things were successful. The compatibility level is 150. Um, so it, just to reiterate that again, like DBA tools takes all of the knowledge and the expertise of all of these community members and puts it into one place for us all to use. And it, it makes our jobs easier. Uh, this is one great example of that. So that was database migrations. All right. The next uh, life hack is how we can make sure we're meeting best practices. So we'll have a look at the test commands that are available, which is what we'll use for this. Uh, we'll make sure we're patched up to the latest versions. Uh, we'll check our compatibility levels another way, check the owners, and then how we can check everything. So get dash command again, this time with the verb mod, uh, with the test verb passed in. And these are all the things we can test. Job owners, DBA builds, compression, DB owners, log ship status. These things are all available, and you can use get dash help passed in these uh, function names and see how you use them and, and some more information. First things first, I'm going to use test DBA build. And I'm going to pass in both instances for this. And I'm going to ask, am I on the latest build? So this is telling my, my index is stale. So I should update. I should use the update parameter to, to make sure I have the latest version. But there's a JSON file in the background uh, with all of the build information to make sure I am uh, compliant and on the latest build. So you can see my two instances that are returned uh, are both not on the latest version. My 2017 instance and my 2019 instance are, are lagging behind which is fine, right? I don't always want to be on the cutting edge on the very latest build. So I can say uh, max behind. I want to be within 10 CUs uh, of production of the latest version. And you can see that this one, the 2017, is within that. This website, dbatools.io slash build, takes that JSON file and puts it in a really great and easy to use format for you to see what the latest versions are for each uh, edition. Uh, what the latest CUs and build numbers are for each version of SQL Server. You can also pipe into test DBA build if I had a list of servers or servers from a um, central management server. I could pipe them straight into test DBA build. All right, so compatibility level. We, al we already saw how we could check that, but we can use test DBA DB compatibility, uh, just selecting some, some properties and formatting it as a table. And you can see that my AdventureWorks database on MS SQL 2 is returning false. It's still not in the correct compatibility level for the server. 
what this is doing is comparing your uh, server compatibility level of your system databases with that of your user databases. Test DBA DB owner. This by default checks that all my databases are owned by SA. Uh, you can specify a different account if you want them to be owned by a certain account, but you can see uh, in this case they are all owned by SA. You can also test the recovery model. So test DBA DB recovery model. This test that we're in the expected recovery model, right? I'm my configured recovery model for all my databases is full, but you can see some are actually in simple recovery mode. They haven't had a full ba a backup, and these two are actually showing that because they're offline, right? But this one model uh, on both instances haven't had a full backup yet, so we're in pseudo simple mode. Test t test DBA temp DB config. Now these are the ones where it starts to get so much knowledge built into these commands. It's really useful. This is taking all of the best practices for tempdb and seeing whether you're, you're meeting them, right? Are my data files of, of equal size? Do I have my max size fet, set on my files? Uh, did I put my tempdb files on the C drive? Um, the number of files should match the number of logical cores. Is that true? This is gonna check all of those things on as many instances as I pass in uh, to make sure we're, in best, we're meeting best practices. We can also use test DBA max stop, which uses this calculator to see uh, whether our max stop is set to the optimal value. This will check for the instance. Uh, you can see I'm at the default. I should consider using recommended instead. And it'll also check the databases uh, if that's valid. Test DBA max memory. This is using Jonathan Cahayas's uh, post, which is really great, but really complicated on how you work out how many, uh, what you should set your max memory to. And there's a couple of DNS issues here because I'm using containers on my laptop. Uh, but basically, it's showing that both instances are set to the default, and I should set them instead to this. Finally, uh, I'm going to quickly mention DBA checks, which is a module that builds on top of DBA tools and uses PESTA to basically test your infrastructure. So I can pass in my two instances and say check database status, and it will go out and check that all of my databases are in the expected status. So you can see I get green uh, and pluses for good, red and minuses for bad. I had two failed tests. And I can come back up here and see that the two databases on MS SQL 1 that we set into an offline state are offline. Um, so DBA checks uh, is worthy of its own session. Uh, but that's just a quick shout out. If you need a way of testing your infrastructure, uh, DBA checks is a great option there. So finally, I've saved the best to last because who doesn't love documentation? I'm going to show you how DBA tools can make that pain free. If we're going to quickly export documentation for our environment, uh, this is great for DR scenarios uh, and, and to monitor for change. So export DBA instance. I'm going to pass in my two instances. I've given it a path of this export folder, which you can see is currently empty and uh, starting to be populated. And I'm just excluding replication settings. It takes a little while to uh, check that, and I'm, it's not in play in my environment. So you can see that these files are currently being generated uh, for MS SQL 1. So this is SP configure. Everything that will be set up uh, for my SP configure, all my different settings, uh, any server roles that are built in or, or I've created, my database mail settings, my databases. So this is all of the backup information I would need to be able to restore my databases to another instance. Now, DBA tools is magic, but it's not that magic. You do need to have your backup files somewhere safe. Uh, if your data center was to explode and you needed to create it somewhere else, you need to have these files on of how you're going to recreate those virtual machines. But you also need your backup files, so make sure those are safe. Logins, any logins that we've created, uh, I will note here that they, these are including the passwords. So when you can generate this, uh, your passwords and SIDs will be the same, which makes this file, uh, you need to keep this super secure, right? There is a exclude password parameter for export DBA instance, uh, which if you're using it to monitor change in your environment, you could use that instead. And then resource governor, any settings for that, any extended event sessions that you've set up, uh, including the built-in ones, but if I had set up a specific one for me, uh, that would be defined in here. And then finally, any SQL agent uh, jobs, schedules, operators. Uh, well, that moved fast. And the final thing that it does is any user objects that are in the system databases, which is pretty interesting. 
All right, so let's take a look at SP configure. As as a last thing for my upgrade, right? I moved my instances, my databases from instance one to instance two. One thing I can do is compare uh, the SP configures from both those instances. And if I'm in Visual Studio Code right now, and if I press F1 to get the command palette and go compare active file with and choose MS SQL 1, it'll highlight any differences in this file, which is really useful because if I migrated my databases from one instance to another and I missed some kind of setting, perhaps like this CLR enabled uh, that my application needs, this will show me and highlight real quick uh, that I may have missed something and I need to turn that on for my application. The other ones are new settings in 2019 that don't exist in 2017. So that is how you can quickly document your entire infrastructure um, using DBA tools. Uh, you can use it to compare instances. You can use it for disaster recovery scenarios, et cetera. So let's pop back to, uh, to this PowerPoint real quick. So all of these demos are available on my GitHub. If you want to download them and test them out, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, reach out if you have any questions when you're going through them. Uh, I'd love to chat about it. Finally, some resources if you need them. Uh, the DBA Tools blog has a lot of great information on it. The first link is the link to the DBA Tools book uh, if you want to check that out. And the second link is a really great blog post on why DBA Tools is secure and why it's enterprise ready, which you can check out there. Middle two links are documentation. Uh, Docs.dbatools.io is all of the comment-based help from all of the commands uh, put out onto a website, which makes it really easy to find what you need uh, and build that out. dbatools.io slash build is that build reference I mentioned. And the last three links are how you can get involved and uh, get in contact with the DBA Tools team. Finally, if you have any questions, like I mentioned after the session, feel free to email me, reach me on Twitter. Uh, there's my GitHub link again. Uh, thank you so much for joining my session. Uh, hope you enjoyed it and you can take DBA tools back to your, uh, back to your environment and, and use it to make your life easier.